perspective in many ways, uh, a broader perspective than, uh, than many operators. Our, our area tech teams, they capture that data and they capture that expertise and they plug it into complex models and simulators and predictive tools and they, they use it to focus holistically on the asset. So for this reason, many of our customers today, they view us as a partner and they bring our people in up front and, and really into the development phase of their asset. You know, our real goal here is collaboration. This is the biggest difference between a work as directed company and a service company partner. Again, the key is both sides understanding the reservoir, planning well bore placement to optimize the completion and, and maximize the drainage, applying the right solutions, uh, integrated solutions that cross product lines and cross service lines. And the bulk of our customers do just that. They use their service company to optimize their play. They, they align with their service company to foster specific technologies that can help them. In other words, they, they tap into this resource. But at the same time, when, when you look at the expanded service intensities around these shale developments, we recognize that as a service company, we have a responsibility to understand our role in the discrete economics of your asset and to find those commercial terms that really work within those economics. Bottom line, our objective at Halliburton is to keep your rigs in the air. So as in planning, it's just as critical to be aligned on execution. In this robust market, costs are going up. A pound of sand, a sack of cement, an hour of labor. You know, the question becomes, how do we as partners continue to make these plays work economically? You know, on the drilling side, historically, services have been procured as individual components. But I would challenge you as operators that you can harvest more value through a drilling system. Drilling fluids, the bottom hole directional assemblies, drill bits, all these processes are really interdependent upon each other for performance. Time and time again, we've demonstrated by combining these elements into a single system, we can reduce the overall drilling time and the overall cost. We've had several examples right here in the Rockies where we've applied a systems approach to, to uh, drilling and we've actually cut the horizontal drilling time in half. Another great example is on the completion side. After casing point, it's about a system again, a system that combines isolation, completions, and stimulation to reduce cycle time. A great example is swell packers, sliding sleeves, and a frack spread, all working in concert to deliver a rapid frack system, reducing the completion time from days down to hours while optimizing production, virtually eliminating much of the non-productive time that's associated with a typical plug and perf operation. So it's all about reducing the operators per unit cost of production. That's how we think at Halliburton. And really both sides reap the benefits. Our customers reduce their overall costs and the service provider does a lot more work with less resources. This is the core of our business model in North America and we've been uh, very successful with it. But the real game changer today is 24-hour uh, operations. Fundamentally, it changes the way that we work. For example, historically on a typical frack job, we go out for a day, we work a well, and we come home. Well, that's certainly true for our people today, but it's not true for our equipment. Today, the equipment stays in the field 24-7. We operate in a mode that we call hyper-utilization. It's multiple product lines working safely in concert around the clock. So why hyper-utilization? The answer is very simple. We've been able to average a four-fold increase in terms of the stages per day. To operate in that 24-7 mode and to deliver those type of results, the evolving service company will have to have ultra-reliable equipment. Take pumping, pumping equipment, for example. A new generation is arriving on location as we speak pumps with a much more efficient stroke cycle. They operate in a wider range with respect to rate and pressure, extending the life of the pump and its parts, and that translates to a lower cost to our customers. Same story on prop and delivery, a more reliable system. It stands vertically, 
It's gravity fed, it's solar powered, and it takes less of a footprint on location. And we're certainly all aware of the shortage of technical expertise. We're all feeling the pain and we continue to raid each other. One solution there is remote operations, moving tenured drilling and completion engineers to centralized operating hubs where they can overlook multiple jobs and multiple operations at once. In essence, spreading out our technical expertise. And that's not just on local jobs, but global, global jobs as well. You know, it's not unheard of today for a Denver shale team to consult on a frack job in Poland. The technology does exist and is in use. So taken all together, these are the complements that make hyperutilization work. And again, the objective is to reduce the unit cost of production for the customer. There's something we're very passionate about at Halliburton, and that's environmental leadership. And I think you heard that today from our CEO, Dave Lassar. To produce a commercial unconventional well, you do have to frack it. And much has been said about the amount of water used in fracturing operations. But let's put it in perspective. For the average amount of water that we use to frack a well, you can operate a coal-fired electric plant for 12 hours. Or you could keep New York City running for about five or six minutes. So on a relative basis, it's a drop in the bucket. But make no mistake about it, water is our most important resource, and we do have to manage it judiciously. One of the best ways we can do this is to clean and reuse produced water and frack water. Last year, uh, we introduced our patented uh, suite, clean suite uh, products. Uh, our first one is Clean Wave. We use uh, electrocoagulation and other techniques to remove the solids and metals from the produced fluid. We're currently reusing millions of gallons of fluid across the U.S. every day. Our clean stream process incorporates UV lights to treat water on the fly, essentially killing bacteria without the use of chemical biocides. And as you heard again from uh, our CEO today, our clean stem is a frac fluid made up entirely of materials from the food industry. And I've drank some two days in a row and I'm still with us. Now these are great technologies and uh, they go a long way in addressing our water management issues, but there is a much larger issue out there. The, the, the prime environmental responsibility for us is to the public and to keep them informed in an open and honest way. Our industry has to be transparent in both how we operate and how we disclose the materials that we use. And I do want to be clear, Halliburton has been at the forefront supporting disclosure. It's absolutely imperative today that as an industry we have strong alignment, that we deliver a factual, unified, consistent message to the public and to our policymakers. And all of us, every one of us, have to take the opportunity to get the facts out, to combat the misinformation that ultimately drives up the cost of energy. There's no doubt today that when you look at the unconventional story, it's being written right here in the Rocky Mountains, being written right here in North America. We harbor most of the technology and the lion's share of the equipment. And as Dave pointed out earlier today, as you can see, the U.S. represents less than 15 percent of the global shale gas reserves. For the last several years, we've had engineers from countries around the world working side by side right here in the U.S. with our shale experts, both in our technical offices as well as in our field operations. They're now returning to their home countries where they'll apply their first-hand knowledge and their unconventional resources. We're already underway working on appraisal wells in continental Europe, Latin America, Australia, and China. So what we're doing here today, what we're creating here in the Rockies, here in North America, the cutting edge technologies, the operating procedures, and more importantly, the environmental policies, we are, right here, we are setting the standard for how the rest of the world will uh, develop their unconventional resource. So with that, I'll close. Ted, I think I kept it within 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate that uh, uh, and, and your 
exactly right. We're, uh, we're creating cutting edge uh, technology as we speak and uh, being employed every single day. Um, our uh, next uh, uh, panelist is uh, Bob Geddes. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Ensign Energy Services. I appreciate Bob coming down from Calgary uh, today to do this. Uh, Ensign, as many of you know, provides oil field services for the North American international markets um, with a very broad array of services. Bob's been in the industry now for over uh, 25 years, spent most of his time on the uh, drilling contracting side. He's a graduate of the University of Alberta. Please join me, folks, in welcoming Bob Geddes. Thanks, Ted. Uh, I must say it was a very good planning putting a drilling company behind a frack company just to get this back on schedule. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Enzyme. First of all, uh, a lot of you may not have heard about us. Um, we're a small, somewhat of a bigger company now. Started 25 years ago in, in Canada with five rigs. We now run 340 rigs around the world. Um, we just made a recent acquisition of Rowan's land-based rigs, uh, which puts us uh, solidly into the, uh, the Haynesville, Eagleford area. Uh, we operate today in about 10 different areas of the world. Um, a lot of excitement in, in, in a lot of these places, Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, Libya. Uh, those rigs are currently down today. <laughs> uh, Australia. Um, it was interesting. Um, um, Lazar put up a, a slide that showed the uh, uh, the gas, the shale gas around the world, and you can see there's a little bit of overlap there. We're currently not in Europe, although we just uh, opened up a Warsaw office, uh, and um, uh, hopefully we'll be drilling some of the wells that uh, Halliburton will be fracking. We're vertically integrated. We, um, we have about 10 different service lines uh, in most of our different areas uh, uh, and expanding into directional drilling. Our, our philosophy is um, um, much of what you heard today is that um, the industry needs to get more experienced people uh, doing more efficient things. Uh, of course, the directional drilling companies have always used the drilling company as the pool of, of resource. Um, every directional driller used to be a driller on a drilling rig. So we've combined the forces. Um, uh, we have about 25 units running any given day here in, in uh, the U.S. and the Rockies, expanding into California. Um, again, part of that, uh, you know, taking uh, two people, turning them into one. Our analogy is you don't see navigators on airplanes anymore and the, the product is, is quite uh, generic now in most cases. We have a strong presence in the North American plays. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's where we started and that's where we continue to grow and quite the focus of, of this, uh, this conference. Our world today, let me tell you about our world today, 70% of the, the wells we drill are unconventional oil or gas. 75% um, of those that Enzyme drills anyway are directional wells and you saw some earlier reports that, uh, that backs that up. Uh, it's very rare that we drill a vertical well anymore. Uh, I'm not sure our guys would know how to do that. Uh, we have experienced personnel um, and they're very hard to find. And um, as Jim pointed out, uh, they're getting nabbed um, as the whole industry moves up. Uh, I'll talk to how we plan to um, uh, combat that in a minute here. Uh, the wells are drilled faster than ever. You know, we're drilling uh, twice as many wells twice as fast. 15% of Enzyme's U.S. fleet is now running on natural gas LNG. In fact, 25% of our U.S. fleet uh, running in the Rockies today is running on natural gas. We consume about, uh, about 10 million a day of gas. Um, and I'll talk to some of those economics in a minute here. So the industry is moving into the wellbore manufacturing business. So I think you've probably heard everyone talk to that, and that's really the next step, which means um, more consolidation of services. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a big move to move into the manufacturing business. I think a whole different mindset is required, and I think we're starting to see that. So what's our world like uh, tomorrow? Well, right now it's blank. There we go. Uh, increased use of natural gas and drilling operations. More and more we're being asked to convert over. We're seeing uh, continued emission reductions as a result. We put out about 30% uh, reduction in emissions, which means we can run more rigs in a certain area. Uh, one example was um, one of the BLMs up in, uh, in Wyoming in the Jonah field. Um, they were getting restricted on the number of rigs that they were using um, for diesel because of the emissions on some of their um, advancement there. Um, they came to us and we, we deployed uh, uh, 
uh, three more rigs into the area with natural gas, allowing them to uh, up the number of holes they could drill in the area on an annual basis um, and still meet the, the emission targets. So, you know, there's an example of it being applied. The, um, the, you know, the surface access issues will require, obviously, more compact rigs into the future that have le less environmental damage. Um, you know, most of the rigs you see today are AC, VFD, regenerative braking type rigs. Um, they work well for, um, for pad applications, so we, we're not um, obtrusive going up and down the road past the farmer every day. Um, and, and of course, the same situation with uh, powering the rig with natural gas um, just means a, a lot less truck traffic going up and down a, a, a gravel location. The proliferation of the ADR style rigs um, are attracting a new workforce. Um, no longer do you see a driller generally out on the rig floor you know, when it's 30 below, he, he's in a cabin um, and he's hanging his, um, his hat up and he's, um, it, you know, we're, we're seeing that attract a completely new different kind of guy. Um, and uh, I think that's necessary in this business. It's obviously safer and it's more efficient. So as I mentioned, the benefits of natural gas on a drilling rig application reduces emissions 30%. The crossover point, um, is, uh, is obviously less than a year. We can save a million dollars of diesel fuel annually and um, basically it costs us just slightly less than a million dollars to transform a rig into a natural gas application. You know, that, uh, that equation works all the way up to about 15, 16 bucks an MCF. So there's, um, there's lots of uh, room to move there. And obviously improve domestic energy security and we're walking the talk. A lot of times people go, okay, great. Uh, you talk about consuming natural gas, what are you doing? Well, we're, we're starting to do that and we're getting more call for it. So that's, um, I promised I'd, uh, I'd make up some time, so there it is.